Hey, Don here. Uh, it's kind of a study, I guess. Uh, I was just going through my Bible this morning and um, just jotting down some notes, reading some stuff, and I thought, well, um, maybe I'll put this into a quote-unquote study. So it, it might be a little bit uh, all over the place. Uh, it's fairly short, um, but it's something. Uh, I made these... These are vases. I guess in art they call them brutalist style, I guess. This one I made for myself. And I'll probably put one of these emblems on. I'm not sure yet. Um, but this one is for my friend Nick. Uh, Nick was the guy that uh, he built Mustangs his whole life, uh, built that Shelby GT350 clone, sold it for $57,000 or something like that. So he's the guy that died, and uh, I thought I'd make a, a flower vase for him, for the family, for the memorial and all that. Um but I was going through uh, Numbers 23, and I ran across a Calvinist proof text. God is not a man, this is Numbers 23, 19. God is not a man that he should lie, neither the son of man that he should repent. Uh, hath he not said, and shall he not do it? Or hath he spoken, and shall he not make it good? Um... Verse 20, Behold, I have received commandment to bless, and he hath blessed, and I cannot reverse it. Uh, basically, they'll use this as a proof text on um, the sovereignty of God and how God uh, can never repent. Uh, because obviously they, they say that uh, God sovereignly uh, in time past, before the world ever began, chose who was going to be saved, who wasn't going to be saved, um, what was going to happen, what wasn't going to happen. Everything was basically written out in a script. And so God wouldn't repent of anything because he's already said this is going to happen, that's going to happen, down to the minutest detail without any free will involved. And there'd be no point in repenting because he sovereignly um, controls everything with his remote control, as it were. But first of all, uh, without getting into it, because uh, this isn't a study on his sovereignty, um, look for sovereignty in the Bible. Just look up those words, sovereign, sovereignty, sovereign election. Just, Just look them up. Um, God doesn't exercise his sovereignty. The Calvinist makes such a huge deal out of God's sovereign, 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 sovereignty. And yet God doesn't exercise it. If he does, it's very, very seldom. Do you know why? Because God is smart enough and powerful enough. He doesn't need a remote control to run everything. You know what I'm saying? He gets in the ring with you and says, Hey, uh, I'm not going to tie your hands behind your back, and I'm not going to use any weapons. You make any move you want, we'll fight fair, and I'll still win. Or if he wants to play chess with you, he doesn't need to make the moves for you in order to screw you up. He lets you make any move on that chess board you want to move. Do anything you want. He's still going to win the chess game. He's that smart. He allows free will and still wins it his way. Can God, uh, can God supply a table in the wilderness? Well, don't you know that the devil can do... Yeah, he can. God can do anything. Even though the devil knows he's going to su supply a table in the wilderness with manna at Sela Petra... God will still do it, and it will still come out right. 
because he's that smart and he's that powerful. He'll let the devil do anything he wants. He'll let, look, the devil knows that God's going to do that. The devil knows that he's going to set up uh, the Jews in Sela Petra and feed them manna. It's like, go ahead, do what you're going to do. I'm still going to preserve them. I'm still going to win. And God does repent. God does repent. Genesis 6. And once you get to, to know God through the Bible, you find that the God that you find in the Bible is so much more um, likable. Is that the word? Lovable. I mean, I just, I really love the God that I read about in the Bible. The sovereign Calvinistic uh, God or the, or the God of the Mormons or the God of other perverts. It's just not right. It's not the right God. It's just like, nah, no, that's not my God. No, 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 no. Fall in love with the God of the Bible. Genesis chapter 6, uh, verse 5. And God saw the wickedness of man. So he's sitting up there, you know, and he sees something. He sees the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. This is something the Lord is observing. This is something the Lord is, is uh, dealing with. And it repented the Lord. It repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth and it grieved him at his heart. The fact that it grieved him at his heart over the stuff that he'd been seeing and, and witnessing caused him to repent. He, he wasn't going to do this. This wasn't the original plan. The original plan was in Genesis 1-1 and Genesis 1-2. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created. That wasn't the original plan. From the face of the earth, both man and beast and the creeping thing and the fowls of the air. For it repenteth me that I have made them. I'm sorry I did it. You know, I thought I was, I thought I was doing the right thing here. And now I'm sorry I did it. Now again, God is smart. And God is powerful. So he works the thing out. He gets, he finds Noah, sees that Noah is uh, perfect in his generations. He's walking before the Lord. And God says, okay, I got an idea. Amen? This wasn't decided before the foundation of the world, sovereignly uh, and all that. He sees Noah and he's like, you know, talking to himself in the Trinity and the Godhead, like he did back in uh, you know, Genesis 1. In Genesis 11, I got an idea. Let's go talk to Noah. Right? God repents. Then he works it out. First Samuel 15. And... 35. And we know this. This is where Saul refuses to kill Agag. Refuses to uh, kill the kill all the animals, the beasts that he was told to kill. And Samuel uh, came no more to see Saul until the day of his death. Nevertheless, Samuel uh, mourned for Saul and the Lord repented that he had made that he had made Saul king over Israel. It wasn't his idea that Saul was to be king. That was Israel was like, hey, we want a king. We want we want a king, Daddy. We want a cookie. You know, we want a king. Just like in 2022, the Jewish people want to be so much like those Gentiles. I see him up on my route all the time. They actually try harder to be a Gentile than the Gentiles try to be Gentiles. Believe me, I, they work at it. I don't know what it is. I guess it's just like a Christian wanting to be so much like the world. That Jew wants to be like the Gentile. So he saw, oh, the Gentiles got kings. I want a king. God's like, all right, fine, whatever. You're going to pay for this one. And of course, God was right. And then he repented. He's like, oh, 
you know, I'm sorry I ever did this. I repent that I ever made Saul king over Israel. What a mess. <clears throat> um, let's see. Here's what he did. Um, and, Saul, and Saul said unto Samuel, Yea, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord. Doesn't that sound like your average church today? I'm going to apply some, I'm going to make some spiritual applications here. But isn't that a, a lot of your, your local churches today your lo and your Christians as individuals? I've obeyed the voice of the Lord. What, you know, what are you talking about? And have gone the way which the Lord sent me. The Lord, the Lord sent me. I, I'm in the way of the Lord. God spoke to me and this is what I'm doing. I don't care if it's illegal. Or I don't care if it's immoral or if it's not right. I know God instructed me. And have brought Agag, the king of Amalek, and have utterly destroyed the Amalekites. But the people, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's, I've heard one, or one pastor was, well, you know, my wife, if my wife leaves me, then what am I going to do in the ministry? So I, I had to get her a brand new house. I had to get her this huge brand new house and the church needs to pay for it. Even though there was a 1200 square foot double, uh, double car garage house literally jumping distance from the church right next door no no she wanted she, my wife it, it's my wife it's the people well you know the congregation they need in this and that yeah don't do what the bible tells you preacher don't do what you're supposed to do blame it on the congregation blame it on your wife blame it on anything blame it on the lost people why don't you blame yourself? He wouldn't blame himself, would he? Saul wouldn't blame himself. But the people took of the spoil, sheep and oxen, the chief of the things which should have been utterly destroyed to sacrifice. Here was our motive. It was a good motive to sacrifice unto the Lord thy God in Gilgal. Doesn't that sound pious? And Samuel said, Hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Where was your King James preacher? Well, we wanted souls to be saved. You know, it was to sacrifice unto the Lord thy God. I mean, they were going to watch the Passion movie anyways. We just thought we would bring them into the, into, into the church here where we could give them popcorn and sodas, and then we could give them the gospel afterwards. What, I mean, you want souls to be saved, don't you? What, what did God say about this kind of thing? Did you realize that the Passion movie was Roman Catholic to the core, like, uh, like Mel Gibson, who created it? Did you realize that it was based on witchcraft, on a nun who was a witch, who had a vision, wasn't based on the passion wasn't based on the Bible at all. It was to sacrifice unto the Lord that God. We wanted to see souls saved. So we brought him into the church. We set up a big screen and, and, and we showed the movie. And then we, we gave him the gospel. And oh, six people got saved. Hallelujah. Praise hallelujah. Six people got saved. Haven't you heard this stuff? You've heard this stuff. And Samuel said, Hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better, better than sacrifice. And to hearken than the fat of rams. Well, six people got, it doesn't matter. You follow the book. Don't call yourself a Bible-believing Christian, let alone a Bible-believing pastor or church, if you're not going to follow it. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. You're a coven, essentially. You're not a church. You're not a Bible-believing church. You're a coven. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. You're just as idolatrous. It's no wonder you're showing an idolatrous Catholic film. You're an idolater. 
because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, the King James, he hath also rejected thee from being king or from being a Bible-believing Baptist church with your candle that he's going to blow your candle. I've seen it happen. I'm not just talking. I've seen it happen. He's like, okay, I'm, I'm repenting that I ever set you up as a Bible-believing Baptist church here in wherever, wherever, I'm not going to say, your candle is blown out. See at the judgment seat of Christ. Like, really? Romans chapter 3, verse 8. You've heard the quote, Let us do evil that good may come. Let us do evil that good people getting saved may come. What are you going to do next? Have the rock band come in? Well, they're going to listen to the rock band anyways, but then we get a chance to lead them to the Lord. Uh-huh. Where's it going? Where is that stuff going? Uh, Amos 4, 4 and 5. Come to Bethel and transgress. Bethel, the house of God. Nothing's ever changed. Come to Bethel, the house of God, and transgress. In Gilgal, multiply transgressions and bring your sacrifice, bring your tithe. Bring your sacrifices every morning and your tithes after three years. And offer sacrifice and thanksgiving with leaven. Come to our worship service where we offer a worship service with leaven on Sunday morning. And proclaim and publish uh, the free offerings. For this liketh you. It sure does. O ye children of Israel, saith the Lord God. Um, let's see, 5, 5, 10. Here's the response. Here's the response they have of uh, guys like Don Nesbitt. And maybe yourself. When you point this stuff out. They hate him that rebuketh in the gate, and they abhor him that speaketh uprightly. Amen? That's what they do. Oh, he's so negative. He's such a hater. He just has nothing good to say. He's against everything and everybody. He thinks he's right and everybody else is wrong. Verse 21, God speaking, I hate, I despise your feast days. Well, we go to church Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. We have prayer meeting. We have choir practice. I hate, I despise your feast days, and I will not smell in your solemn assemblies. Though ye offer me burnt offerings and your meat offerings, I will not accept them. Well, you know what we've done for the Lord? Our church is so powerful. Oh, we've supported all these missionaries, and we've done this, and we've done that, and we've done this, and we've written books, and blah, blah, blah. I will not accept them. Smoke at the judgment seat of Christ. Neither will I regard the peace offerings of your fat beasts. Take thou away from me, the noise of thy songs. He doesn't want your worship service because you stink. He doesn't want to hear your song service. He wants you to get your act straight. He wants you to start following what the King James Bible tells you to follow and start floating your boat correctly. Then start singing your songs and having your praise service and all the rest of it. Get your act right. Straighten your church out. People... Uh, not, not going to do it. For I will not hear, I will not even hear the melody of thy vials, thy choir service or whatever. Verse 24, here it is. But let judgment, judgment run down as waters and righteousness as a mighty stream. Hath ye offered unto me uh, Sacrifices, offerings, and wilderness 40 years or see so forth. I'm applying it spiritually. I'm applying it spiritually. But you get it. And unfortunately, some of you got it this morning. Amen? You're like, yeah, I know. I know. I know. 
Um, let's see, where do I want to go? It comes down to, um, it comes down to on the sovereignty, back on the sovereignty, it comes down to the writing. Has God committed what he said to writing? Here's a type here. Um, 119. Now these notes just scattered around. Now, in Esther, this king is a type of God the Father. And it says, I'm trying to look through my phone here. If it please the king, let there go a royal commandment from him and let it be written among the laws of the Persians and Medes that it be not altered, that it be not altered. There's the type. Once God commits, um, commits his words to writing, then he can't repent of it. He can't go back on it. That's the deal. Um, let me see here. Uh, where do I want to go here? Let's go. Um, yeah. Uh, it's not, it is 38. Yes. Here we go. And the sun is shining through my phone like crazy. I worship toward thy holy temple and praise thy name for thy loving kindness and for thy truth. For thou, God, thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. Why is that? How is that? Because once God um, commits what he said to writing, he can't go against it, even though he's God. Well, he's sovereign. Mm, that's not how he works. Once he commits it to, to writing, he can't go against it, even though he's God. Now, of course, if you have an NIV, it says, you have exalted above all things your name and your word. Why did the NIV say that? Because they don't believe that God magnifies his word above all his name. They don't even believe that God has uh, his word. They don't believe in God's word. Uh, let's see. <laughs> Three, four. Man, the sun is crazy. Um, I'll just read here without looking through the phone. And Jonah began to enter into the city a day's journey, and he cried and said, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. So this is what God... Now, yeah, verse 3. So Jonah rose and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. All right, but this is the spoken word of the Lord. This isn't something Jonah read. So he goes in and he tells Nineveh what God said to him. Nineveh shall, shall be overthrown. Sovereignty of God. But um, this heathen king knew more about uh, God than the Calvinist did. Verse 8, But let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily unto God, yea, let them turn. God wants you to repent. You're not sovereignty elect, sovereign, sovereignly elected to damnation or to salvation. You have a chance here. You can change the decree. Let them turn everyone from his evil way and from the violence that is in their hands. Like uh, uh, women fighting in, uh, what's it called, AMA, martial arts, the, uh, I don't even know what it's called, I don't watch it, the ultimate fighting in the cage and all that. Now they have women doing it, just like back uh, before the flood of Noah. Verse 9, who can tell if God will turn and repent? And turn away from his fierce anger that we perish not. He can change his mind. It hasn't been committed to writing. Verse 10, And God saw their works, and they turned from their evil way. 
gee, I thought it was sovereignly decided before the foundation of, no, no, they changed the decree by free will. And God repented of the evil that he said that he would do unto them, and he did it not, even though he said he would. He didn't do it. Why? It wasn't committed to writing. It wasn't committed to writing. That's the thing. And again, well, you're kind of all over the place. Think of it. It's all connected. It comes down to what does God, what has God said? What did God say? He holds himself. We're talking about God here. If God can hold himself to his written words and realize that he himself has to submit to the words in this book, how much more should you? Well, we're a big church and we're a pastor such and such and you ought to know what we... You're nothing. Like Dr. Ruckman would say, you're nothing, you're nothing, you're nothing but a nothing. You're not a thing at all. Right? Remember that? If God can submit to the words of his book, I think you and I can. He holds his book, his word, above all his name. That's the highest thing. God's not going to do anything wrong to get someone saved. And the Bible says that if he's not willing, then any should perish. But that all should come to repentance. And yet, he won't do one wicked thing. He won't do one wrong thing to save anybody. Well, this will bring people into the congregation. Then God wouldn't do it. Well, this will get them saved. If it's wrong, God wouldn't do it. Always comes back to the book, doesn't it? Well, hopefully you got something out of that. Blue Collar Study. Amen.